So welcome to this webinar on the new OFS condition on harassment and sexual misconduct. My name is Susie Allenson. I'm the Safeguarding and Welfare Manager at the OFS and I'm really pleased to be here chairing today's webinar. So as you can see, there's lots of attendees today, which is great. Um, we understand that most of you will be familiar with how the condition is framed um, and we hope that you've had a chance to have a good look at it beforehand. So today's session is really an opportunity to discuss the condition in a bit more detail, um, focus on our requirements and how these will operate in practice. Um, as there are so many of us, please do keep your microphones muted uh, throughout the presentations. We're recording the event, but only the presentation, not the Q&A section. So we'll switch off recording during the Q&A to help everyone feel more open to participating. Um, we won't be using raising hands in this webinar because of the numbers. So we're asking you to use the Q&A function to ask questions. Um, and that means we can try and answer as many as possible in the time that we have. Um, given how many attendees we have, we probably won't be able to get through every question, but we're going to do our best to get through as many as possible. And we'll look to kind of group questions where relevant to get through as many as we can. So please don't worry if we don't get to your question right away um, or if it doesn't sound exactly as you've asked it. Um, but please do ask questions as they occur to you. So you can do that throughout the presentations. Um, so you're aware when you ask your question, your name will be visible next to it, but I won't read your name out loud when I pose it to the panel. We're asking participants not to disclose any personally identifiable information during the session, including not referring to any individual students or staff by name or in any other way that might allow them to be identified, particularly as we're discussing potentially sensitive issues and any personally identifiable information captured would be fully anonymised after the meeting. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, we're discussing sensitive topics today and we recognise that some of the definitions we'll be talking about might cause some distress. We won't be talking about specific cases, but we recognise that some of the examples we talk about may also cause distress. So please do bear this in mind for your own attendance and in consideration of the questions that may be asked in the Q&A chat. We will use any questions from the Q&A to make amendments on the website where clarification is needed. Um, and due to the sensitive nature of the topics we'll be discussing today, we would ask that anyone who is age 16 and under, please leave the call. So I'll, I'll just give a few seconds for anyone to leave who is aged 16 and under. OK, so next slide, please. Um, so due to time constraints, we've we've only got an hour today, we won't be able to cover every element of the condition. So we're going to focus on key areas and topics where, we've, where we have received pre-submitted questions. So we know there's interest from students. Um, and the running order for today is um, a little bit of introduction from me. Um, we'll talk a bit about the timeline and consultation responses. Um, and then the condition requirements. And then we've got some information on the pilot prevalence survey of sexual misconduct, which we also published at the same time as the condition. And then we've tried to allow around 25 minutes for Q&A so that we've got a good chunk of time to get through as many questions as we can. Um, and then we're, we're looking to close at 4 p.m. today. Next slide, please. Uh, so on our panel, we've got David Smy, who is Deputy Director of Enabling Regulation. Um, he's going to be presenting on the condition requirements. Uh, Rob Denny, who is Student Service Manager, is going to present a brief overview of the pilot prevalence survey on sexual misconduct. And we've also got Director, Director for Freedom of Speech and Academic Freedom, Arif Ahmed, who's going to join us for the Q&A. And he's going to answer any questions that relate to the relationship between the new condition and existing freedom of speech requirements. Next slide, please. So a bit of a timeline uh, about how we've got here. So through Catalyst funding, uh, HEFKI, which was our predecessor body, and the OFS provided £4.7 million to 119 projects to tackle sexual misconduct, online harassment and hate crime. So it's been an area we've been interested in for, for quite some time. In April 2021, following consultation, we published our statement of expectations. 
<clears throat> and this gave a set of recommendations to support universities and colleges to develop Im and implement effective systems, policies and processes to prevent and respond to incidents of harassment and sexual misconduct. We then commissioned uh, an independent organisation, Sums Consulting, to perform an independent evaluation of the initial impact of this statement of expectations. Um, and it was a voluntary statement of expectations. They published their findings in November 2022. One of the recommendations that was that we should consider making prevention and response a mandatory duty and part of our regulatory framework. Um, so last year, we consulted on introducing a condition of registration on harassment and sexual misconduct. And as I'm sure you know, we published the outcomes of this consultation at the end of July 2024 and announced a new condition, which is E6. Um, requirements related to non-disclosure agreements, which was a specific provision in, in the condition, came into force on the 1st of September this year. Uh, the rest of the requirements of the condition will come into force on the 1st of August 2025 next year. In the meantime, the sector is going to be preparing for the condition coming fully into force, and we are engaging during this period, including through these webinars, to support the preparation. And throughout the academic year, we've been clear that we expect universities and colleges to develop robust policies and processes, and we do expect them to engage with their students while they're developing this work to really understand what their students need and ensure that the university or college's approach will work for them. Uh, next slide, please. So thank you to all who responded to the consultation. It may be that some of you here today did. Um, we had 261 responses to the online consultation um, and we had a, a, a high number of responses from students and student representative bodies compared to other consultations of this kind that we've done, which was 17% of the total. Most responses we received through the online survey, but we did also run three roundtables with students to hear their views to really um, encourage participation and ensure that student voice was um, embedded in this. And we held webinars for students and for universities and colleges and spoke at sector events. Next slide, please. So I'm now going to hand over to David to talk through some specifics of the condition requirements. All the information is available on our website and the condition text and regulatory guidance is the definitive source for information on compliance. Um, but David's going to go through a few select aspects of the condition based on questions people have asked in advance of today and that we've received in our conversations with the sector. Over to you, David. Uh, thanks a lot, Susie. Um, uh, and, and really good to see so many people uh, joining this. It's it's great to have you all here. Um, so yeah, I'm going to give a brief overview of the requirements of the condition. Uh, this is this is definitely a summary. So um, the condition itself is is the source of the precise word and formulation, and, and there is guidance that we published that goes underneath it. So first of all, just a bit of context. So we're going to talk a lot about the condition here. So what is a condition of registration? Essentially, to, to stay registered with us, um, providers have to show that they offer high quality higher education and our conditions of registration across a whole range of issues. Um, so direct uh, things around sort of teaching and student outcomes, but also things like finance, governance uh, are, are designed to make sure that they maintain these high standards. So essentially, these are requirements for, for providers to meet. Um, I've just said the word provider a few times. So the short for higher education provider, that means universities, colleges, you know, any of the people who who we regulate, which is obviously a, a quite diverse um, group of, of higher education providers. So that, that's why we use the term rather than something like university, which only only covers a, a subset of them. Um, so so in, in terms of summarising the condition requirements, um, the, the key question around scope are um, firstly, what is the subject matter? So the subject matter is uh, harassment and sexual misconduct. And, and it's really important that while there are some specific elements of the condition that are, are focused on on just one of those, the the kind of the, the structure of the condition and and the the condition as a whole really uh, fundamentally applies equally to both. So it's it, it's most of the uh, mechanics of the condition apply in kind of exactly the same way to, to harassment and to sexual misconduct. Um, and then secondly, um, which students? So. Um, this covers kind of all students um, that, that our higher education provider is responsible for. 
Um, so that would include uh, postgrad students, that would include students at um, uh, franchise provision, um, those sorts of things. So, so it's, it's it's broad essentially is the answer to students, and there's, there's more material on that in the in the guidance. Um, the the specific requirements in, in summary that we, that we have here. So the requirements about um, policies and procedures. Um, so one of the, the sort of structural core of the, the condition, in a sense, is a requirement for, for each provider to to kind of create, maintain and comply with um, a single comprehensive source of information which sets out kind of what they're going to do in terms of harassment and sexual misconduct. And that covers um, things that will be true for all providers, sort of what is our reporting system, what is our investigation system, but also covers kind of what other things that they're doing to to understand and, and tackle the harassment and sexual misconduct in, in their particular uh, context. Um, there's also requirements. We, we, we have minimum content requirements for what has to be included in that single comprehensive source of information. And we have we have content principles and prominence principles kind of about how, how that works, about how it has to be made. Um, more visible to students. Um, there are also requirements about um, intimate personal relationships between staff and students. So the, the shape of this requirement is that providers must um, set out one or more steps that they will take to protect students from abuse of power and conflicts of interest that, that can emerge in, in those sorts of personal relationships. Um, and, and that there's um, uh, we're going to be saying more on that in, in, in a later slide about, about some of the specifics around that. Um, there's requirements around to make sure that the providers have the capacity and resources that they need to comply with the conditions. They can't say, well, you know, I didn't, I didn't comply with it because I, I didn't have the resources for it. Um, there's requirements around um, freedom of speech. So there, there's a freedom of speech principle, uh, which is designed to make sure that it's, it's really clear how harassment interacts with um, freedom of speech. Um, there's a re requirement about the disclosure of information, which sounds probably a little bit abstract, but essentially that's uh, about NDAs, so that's non-disclosure agreements, uh, that that prohibits the use of, of NDAs and, and, and sort of similar things. So you, it's it's anything that 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 sort of does what an NDA does, whether whether or not it's kind of formally called that and framed in that sort of way. And the condition, the text of the condition also sort of defines um, key terms such as harassment, sexual misconduct, abuse of power. And we'll we'll talk about those definitions uh, in a moment because they're, they're they're quite important to understand the rest of the um, condition. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, so I've already talked about the the single comprehensive um, source of information. I wanted to flag some of you I know have responded to responded to our consultation when it was um, when it was live. So I wanted to flag some some particular things that have changed and and some core elements of these. Um, so the single comprehensive source of information in, in the consultation, we talked about a single document. Um, we, we, we've amended that to be a, a sort of source of information, which could be a single document, but it might also be or a single web page, but might also be something which which summarizes information and then links to individual policies elsewhere. Um, the, the the single comprehensive source of information and including the things it links to has to include things on prevention of harassment, sexual misconduct, reporting systems, investigations, processes, support for students, approach to training for both staff and students. Um, so it's all the stuff that essentially that would have been in the single document, but but we've given flexibility on the form because of some of the feedback we had both from providers and, and from students that, that sort of trying to get everything into one document might, might just not be um, Kind of hugely practical it may be more helpful to, to, to be able to sort of break it down through different links uh, the freedom of speech principle um is really important so it's it, it's a requirement essentially that uh, provide the condition in a way that is consistent with with freedom of speech principles that we've set out um so those are concerned with the importance of freedom of speech and making sure that when providers are thinking about their policies and processes and then when they're acting under those policies and processes that that, that isn't done sort of it's not that sort of one bit of the organization is thinking about that and another bit is to think about freedom of speech but that the two are, are kind of joined up um and include is, is a rebuttable presumption um that exposure of students to course materials to kind of statements made, views expressed by by someone as part of teaching, research, discussions about um, things that are on on higher education courses are unlikely to constitute harassment. So that that's a rebuttable presumption. So it, you know that there may be situations where you 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 really can demonstrate that that someone does actually harass someone in that context. But the starting position is that you know you need to be able to have 
you know, sort of, uh, you know, robust discussions, including on kind of controversial and difficult topics, um, and the the the, the work to prevent harassment and sexual misconduct shouldn't shouldn't end up sort of chilling those important freedom of speech principles. Um, and then lastly, I've already mentioned disclosure agreements. Um, this was the the, the restrictions on um, uh, non disclosure agreements were were widely supported by um, by, by students and their representatives who who answered our consultation in, in particular. Um, th this bit of the condition has already come into effect. So I think it was shown on Susie's earlier slide. So so. NDAs are, are and similar restrictions are already not allowed at, at providers. Uh, so providers must not prevent or restrict students from sort of talking about um, allegations of harassment or sexual misconduct. Um, so we, we we think that NDAs are are, are unacceptable. They, they prevent students from speaking about their experiences. They might protect the reputation of perpetrators and, and kind of allow uh, behaviour to continue when when there really are kind of opportunities to to address it. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Um, so this is the definition of harassment, um, which if you um, have, have been engaged with the consultation previously, you'll recognise. Uh, the, the, the key point here is it includes sort of two um, sub-elements, essentially, so sort of two definitions of harassment together. W one is harassment on the basis of, of protected characteristics. Um, so that's kind of racist harassment, sex harassment and so on. Um, and one is harassment is defined by the Protection from Harassment Act, um, which which doesn't um, only um, apply where, where it's to do with a protected characteristic. It can be sort of sort of interpersonal harassment without any of those characteristics coming into play, but but has other kind of conditions to meet. Um, we, we've made clear that um, the condition uh, covers uh, the conduct of students towards other students. Uh, and, and that's that's important because the um, harassment on the basis of protected characteristics under the Equality Act. So um, the Equality Act itself um, doesn't um, bind the, the the actions of students towards students. It, it, it would cover how, how a provider acts towards towards its students, but it wouldn't cover student on on student harassment in those terms. Uh, and what we're doing doesn't change the, the the scope or the obligations under the Equality Act. What it does is is create regulatory obligations that say the sorts of things that would count as, as harassment under the Equality Act are, um, are are harassment in terms of our regulatory requirements and therefore need to be tackled in the ways that are set out in this uh, condition. Um, so so we're we, we think that's really important to make sure that, that we're, we're kind of protecting students in a, in a range of ways. The 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 text on the screen just brings out some of the um, the, the key elements that we've set out in the condition text and the guidance, including, as I referred to earlier, this this really important point that this is not intended to um, inhibit um, the, the, the the sort of other requirements that exist on providers in terms of uh, free speech. So we're not saying for the purposes of you know, if you're worried that it, that it sort of may lead to harassment in some way and you're not sure that that you should um, interfere with with speech and, and you certainly shouldn't interfere with uh, lawful speech um, to meet this condition because providers are are kind of required to to support uh, free speech. Um, next definition, so next slide please, is the definition of sexual misconduct. So again, you if you've been involved in engaging with consultation, you'll recognise this definition is very similar to what we proposed at the at the consultation, which was was widely supported by um, students and their representatives who, who responded. That the, the key response we got from both some student respondents and, and some providers and others was um, removing the references to the Sexual Offences Act 2003, which was previously given um, in relation to those those three things in in the in the bullet. Um, Essentially, we think that whether we refer to the Sexual Offences Act or not doesn't doesn't really affect the the meaning of the condition because the the primary definition remains unwanted or attempted unwanted conduct of a sexual nature, and, and I think we're clear that things underneath it would would, would sort of solidly fall within um, that definition. Uh, we've removed the, the reference to the Sexual Offences Act because people found there's all sorts of concerns about whether this is kind of replacing the the kind of you know legal recourse and legal process and so on which which were kind of um which we thought were unhelpful and people obviously found unhelpful so, so we got rid of that but we think the the substance of that remains the same um what's also really important is is is, is that framing of includes but is not limited to so we, we've given sort of three examples of things that might be covered 
uh, which we've provided essentially most of all the, those those are listed to make clear that this does include really serious forms of sexual misconduct um but but it's not it's not limited to that so so the core definition remains unwanted or uh, attempts to unwanted conduct of a sexual nature and and it's also worth saying that we're we're really clear in the guidance that um online behaviors are are, are captured by this by this definition uh, next slide please um, so I wanted to touch on, on training for students because this is something where there's been lots of interest in the um, consultation process and also where I imagine a, a lot of you would be quite, kind of quite concretely interested. Um, there, there are two things and it includes but not limited to so 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 providers will have to think about what is, is needed to, to, to appropriately inform students about um, harassment and sexual misconduct so, so, so it, it may be beyond these but the two specific things that we identify at first, at the start of each year, all students need to we, they need to make sure that all students understand um, the, the content of the um, single comprehensive source of information that I mentioned before. So essentially, what that means is, you know, in, in concrete terms, students should know, um, you know, what what the reporting process looks like, what the investigation process looks like, what sort of support they'd be available to, how they can access it, and I think that's that's really important. We um, Rob's going to talk about this later, but we, we found in, in some of the polling work we did that students don't always know um, kind of what to do in those circumstances. And we think it's really important that they do. And then secondly, that at induction, so, so new students joining a, a provider should be trained on um, what behaviour might constitute harassment or sexual misconduct. And, and, and we, we talk about kind of bystander training and so on in that context. Um, these are these are mandatory. So we've said that the, the, the this providing has to this has to be delivered to students and we, we've had some questions about um what that what mandatory means including concerns that some students might find um you know due to their own personal experience of these issues might find engaging in these sorts of these sorts of training really really difficult um what we've said in the guidance is that we we, we expect you know as with lots of our conditions university colleges will need to use their judgment to an extent um we essentially the the, the training is mandatory but we recognize as in other cases that there may be um sort of individual exemptions based on the sorts of things that, that i was talking about there um but we, what we've also said is, is that we expect universities and colleges to be you know, to be really kind of engaged with this and the principle of this and, and, and trying to make sure that it's it, it, it's rolled out. So if, if a university or college um, a few years time from now said, oh, you know, it, it turns out that kind of 60 percent of our students, um, you know, get an exemption from from coming to our training, um, that would probably suggest to me that either they're giving exemptions out when they shouldn't be or that they are doing the training in a way that genuinely loads of the students find you know very sort of uh difficult to engage with and 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 don't want to be part of and either of those things would be concern would be concerning so so we expect providers to think about how they can support people to engage with the training um while recognizing that there might be some people with with kind of um individual circumstances we've also questions about on kind of online training um which we've clarified in in the in, in response to some of the consultation feedback essentially we're the issue isn't online versus in person. Um, I'm sure you all have, have, have you know strong views in different ways about about the how important being in person versus online is. But the the, the key point here is is that it should be uh, interactive. Um, there should be opportunities for people to ask questions. There should be opportunities for discussion. So so what we wouldn't want is a kind of you know a, a, an off the shelf click through online module um, where people just log in and, and click a few buttons and then it says well done you, you've now understood harassment and sexual conduct we want there to be opportunities for for engagement obviously engagement can be done online um, so it's, it's not about the format per se um, we've also had some questions about um, that including I think ahead of, of, of this session from some of you about whether bystander training is a requirement of the condition um, We've listed bystander training as as an example of of how a university or college might demonstrate it's complied with the requirements and the guidance. So it's, it's kind of identified as a way to do that, but it's not a, a an explicit requirement that it, it kind of must be bystander training. It must be it must be something that 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 delivers this outcome. We we know um, from from the yeah. independent evaluation of the statement of expectations that we had that that mandatory by, bystander training was was identified as an example of a really good practice in the sector. So it's kind of it's a good way to do it, but it's not the only way to do it. 
could I have the next slide, please? Um, next on um, student support, which I think this is this is really important. Um, so there's a requirement that the that the provider includes information about the the, the things that it that, that it does to support students, um, the things that it does for um, reporting processes and, and how it runs investigations. And all of those are obviously can have a really significant impact on a student's um, experience after the, an incident of, of harassment or sexual misconduct. As I've said, the training requirements means that people should should understand this and should know what they're to expect and what they're entitled to. Um, and, and we've given some examples in, in the guidance about the sorts of things kind of concretely that we'd expect around each of these. So we say that um, support should be av available to students who, who've alleged or experienced um, harassment or sexual misconduct, whether or not they make a formal report about an incident. So it, support isn't, isn't kind of kept behind making a formal report. Um, it's 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 made available whether or not the incident has occurred on the provider's premises or or in a connection with the student kind of being a student so, so uh providers should be supporting students kind of when they face these things in general even if if them facing it is is, is itself not not directly to do with the provider and also that support should be available to an appropriate for students with different needs including where that relates to protected characteristics so it's not sort of one size fits all uh, in terms of reporting, um, we say that there should be a range of different mechanisms for making the report, including both in person and online. Um, and, and we say that the provider should be thinking about how they can remove any actual or, or perceived barriers that, that make it difficult for, for people to make reports. Um, for investigations, um, we say that it's important that the, that the process um, about when, when an investigation would, would start and why is, is clear and easy to understand. Um, and that it's clear about how it addresses any allegations that might also constitute a criminal offence, uh, which we talked about earlier. Uh, we also say that it's important that timescales for investigation and decision making are, are, are clear and accessible and explicit. Um, so, so I think all of those things are just important for, for students' experience of these issues. Um, comes to times so of moving quickly on uh, next slide um, on staff student relationships. So, so I've said there's a requirement that um, providers set out what they'll do to protect students from abuse of power. Um, we've made clear that banning relationships between students and, and kind of relevant staff members um, would be an effective way to meet this requirement. Uh, and, and relevant staff member means someone who's got direct academic responsibilities or, or other direct re professional responsibilities relating to a student, so sort of supervisors and so on, teachers. Um, we, we, we talk about uh, exceptions for certain things sort of around pre-existing relationships and so on. So 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 there, there is a model of a ban that, that providers can pick up and, 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 and do. But we have said that pr providers may take other um, other routes that they want to, but they have to make sure that they are doing sort of substantive things to protect students from abuse of power. It's not simply enough, for instance, just to say, you know, we discourage staff students relationships. We, we, we would expect more than that. Um, and then final slide from me. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so we, we we know that students really care about this. Um, the engagement of, of of some of you and, and other students has been really valuable to to the, it progressing over the years, uh, and the the feedback during consultation has been really helpful for shaping the new conditions too. Um, the condition comes into force, as we've said, apart from the NDA bits already in force, comes into effect on the 1st of October 2025. So this is a really key time for engaging with uh, universities and colleges to make sure that they, they're kind of listening to the student voice and how they design this. The, the condition is deliberately designed to, to require people to think about their particular context. So it's not just one size fits all. So they really should be listening to students and understanding what the need is. Um, so, so really do encourage you to, to kind of reach out and, and try and get involved in that. Um, if after August 2025, when it comes into force, you think that they're not meeting the conditions of registration, we encourage you to raise it with them. Uh, you can also report it to us through our, our notifications process. And as I've said, NDAs, that's already a requirement. So if you see that happening now, similarly, you should raise it with them and with us. Uh, and with that, I'll pass over to uh, Rob, please. Thanks, David. Um, hello, everyone. So I am going to give you an overview of our prevalence survey pilot from 2023. 
Um, just to start off with, um, it might be worth setting out what a prevalence survey is. So a prevalence survey is something, it's, it's a survey which shows us how often something happens within a specific group of people at a given point in time. So the prevalence survey we designed um, was to measure the proportion of students in English higher education who had experienced sexual misconduct. Um, why did we undertake a prevalence survey? Well, our starting point was that um, the understanding of prevalence of sexual misconduct in higher education was underdeveloped. Um, we have, uh, at the moment, we rely on crime reporting data, which is problematic because not obviously not all crimes get reported. Um, there's the ONS Crime Survey um, in England and Wales, and there's a range of really helpful surveys and research carried out at provider level. Um, and what these show us is that sexual misconduct does appear to be quite widespread, but we're not clear on the extent and the scale of the issue. Um, there was also a key recommendation from the evaluation report that David mentioned um, from a statement of expectations that there should be a national prevalence survey on sexual misconduct. Um, and in doing so, we could create a better understanding of rates, contexts and incidents and areas under reporting. So in 2023, we developed and ran a pilot survey to understand how widespread sexual misconduct was in higher education um, and to learn more about the context in which it occurs. So the survey aimed to inform the design and approach of a future wide scale prevalence survey. Um, so our, our, our approach was um, a little bit different from um, that which has gone before. So rather than focusing on a sting, single institution or just a group of students, the survey sought to include nearly all the students studying at higher education courses at the um, providers which took part. So in that respect, it was um, the first and probably the largest survey of its kind in the UK. Um, so it's really important that we, we approached it as a pilot in the first instance. The, the questionnaire itself was developed with a stakeholder group. Um, the group was comprised of uh, expert practitioners and academics who work in the area of um, sexual, sexual harassment. And um, this group also advised us on research ethics so that we, we had a really clear steer on how to minimise harm to um, people who took part in the survey, but also people administering the survey for us. The, the questionnaire drew on um, international examples of questionnaires like this. So there's, um, there's, a, there's a survey in America called the ARC-3, which is used by many, many universities over there to, um, to, measure, to measure these things. Um, so we took that survey and we adapted it for um, the English higher education context. Um, and in doing so, we, we did quite a lot of testing on it. So we, um, we did some qualitative pre-fieldwork testing with students. Um, so this involves students reading through the questionnaire and then um, engaging like a qualitative interview process where we ask them what they think the question is asking them, how they would answer it um, and those kind of things. Um, and the idea is that we can gauge how students understand the questions um, and we can also trial some of the contextualising information we, we built in around the survey too. Uh, and, and in doing that, we really wanted to understand um, what students thought we were asking um, to make sure that they were really, really clear about what it is that we were, we were looking, looking for. So <clears throat> we, the other thing we wanted to do is, make, is to try and understand what kind of data it was possible to get through running a survey like this. So uh, what, what level of data and the kind of data quality we could expect from a, from a um, wider prevalence um, survey. Um, the field work took place in September through to November 2023. Um, thank you very much to the 12 providers who took part in the pilots. Uh, we've got a list of those providers on our website. Um, it was 12 providers in England. Um, we excluded colleges from the pilot because of uh, technical issues around how, how administrative data is collected and stored. So, so it was just universities that took part in, in this pilot work. Um, we uh, ran the pilot through a contractor who did it on our behalf, a research agency. Um, and they contacted students three times in total over the, over the course of the field work, um, once through their institutional email and then a further two times through their personal email address. Um, and we felt this this is less than you might do for other surveys, but we felt that was probably appropriate given that this was a, a pilot and B, the, the nature of the questions that we were proposing to ask. Um, in the survey itself, we included links to uh, local and national resources. Um, and ensured that there were appropriate content warnings in prominent places throughout the questionnaire. We also made it clear that students could exit any time they wanted to. Um, in a second, I'm just going to talk about some of the results, but one, one of the key things we found was that actually we had a really quite a low response rate. So response rate was around 4%. Um, 
and it's quite a lot lower than we'd hoped for, although it's probably not that unusual for a survey um, of this kind. So could I have the next slide, please? So before I just go through this, um, I'll say that the information is all available on our website. There's um, uh, quite a lot of documentation there. If you want to go and take a look, there's a results document, there's an evaluation report, and there's um, uh, a really nice Tableau data visualization which sets out all of this data in aggregated form from the pilot. And you can break it down by demographic characteristics too. Um, the other thing to say is the design of the questionnaire, um, it, it, it took what was sometimes called a behavioural approach. So we, instead of asking students if they had experienced sexual harassment, for example, um, we presented students with a list of behaviours which in themselves constituted sexual harassment and then asked if they'd experienced any of them since becoming a student. And, and if they had, we asked again if any of those had happened in the past 12 months. So for um, sexual harassment, we've got some of the following findings. We found that 30% of students in our um, who took part had experienced sexual harassment since becoming a student, and 20% of those had experienced it in the past 12 months. Um, again, for the past 12 months, we saw uh, greater prevalence for respondents who were female. 27% had experienced sexual harassment, um, had a disability, so that's 32% who were bisexual, that's 37%, or gay or lesbian, 34%. And we also saw that age was important as well, with prevalence uh, of experiencing sexual harassment in the past 12 months being greater for those under 21 years old, so that's 31%. We found that perpetrators were most often men, so that's 79%. Um, and we found that just 12% of people who'd experienced sexual harassment and um, had sought support from their provider. We then asked a series of questions around um, sexual violence, so that includes um, sexual violence and sexual assaults, um, and we adopted a similar behavioural approach whereby we listed a, um, a range of behaviours as students have had experienced any of these. So here we found that 16% of students had experienced sexual violence or sexual assaults since becoming a student, um, and 9% of those had experienced it in the past 12 months. Again, we saw prevalence was greater for some groups, so this included female respondents, 13%, respondents with a disability, 19, um, 18%, um, those who were bisexual, 22%, and gay or lesbian students with 21%. And again, those under 21 years old were, were more likely than average as well, 16%. Here we found perpetrators were most often students from their university, and most often men, male, 85%. We also asked um, students about relationships with uh, members of staff. Uh, we saw that 1% of students had had an intimate relationship with a member of university staff. Um, we asked about confidence and reporting mechanisms. So around half of students were confident about where to seek support within their university for experiences of harassment or sexual misconduct. Um, but we saw some differences by sex here. So female students um, 34% and male students 21% were not confident in where to go for support. Can I have the next slide please? So what's next? We plan to continue this work in 2025 and we'll be trialling a further pilot with students. So this will be a short online only version of the survey um, and it will be administered on our, our behalf by Ipsos Mori, who, who run the National Student Survey for us. So we'll be using the same platform that they provide for the NSS. Um, and this means that students will be invited to take part in the pilot after they have completed the NSS 2025 survey. So this will be just for students at providers in England. And it will come to the end of the NSS. So once the NSS has been completed and submitted, they'll be asked if they'd like to take part. Um, it'll be a short form version of the questionnaire that will be tested in the 2023 pilot um, and we've shortened it right down in the aim to minimise respondent survey fatigue so we're aware that they've already students would have already answered quite a long survey. Um, again we'll, we'll include similar content warnings to ensure students are clear about what's being asked and why um, and our, our purpose in doing this is to learn more about the student experience at national level um, explore whether the method for survey delivery is effective and to also test the survey window between January and April. Um, and so plans for publication will be um, determined next year in 2025. So thanks very much. I'm going to hand back to Susie, who can chair the Q&A.
Thanks very much, Rob. Um, so we're going to stop the recording now. Um, as I mentioned before, it was just the recording up until this point.